The average person is said to spend 15 minutes in the bathroom. Why not take advantage of that time and learn something new? Presenting the 15-minute podcast on weird facts, crazy details, and funny particulars that you'll be able to enjoy while you're taking a sh- Well, on your free time. Welcome to The Shit with Sam Butler. Welcome to another episode of The Shit Podcast. Thank you guys for joining me once again. I uh, have a very interesting topic. I know the set looks different. Uh, maybe the audio isn't the best. I apologize, but due to work circumstances, I couldn't make it into the studio this week, but I didn't want to leave you all without an episode. So I'm doing what I can. I have my friend Luisardo Garcia helping me uh, put this together <laughs> here at home. Uh, welcome to my home. Uh, with that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, an, an interesting article that I came across about a Mexican boxer. And um, I didn't know this history. I, I, I'm a fan of boxing. I like boxing. I didn't particularly know about this boxer. And uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, shit podcast because this guy was the shit. Um, we're talking about a guy named Jose Huitlacoche Medel. Now, uh, I know a lot of you guys that uh, speak English might not know what Huitlacoche is. And that's, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what Huitlacoche is. Uh, and uh, I had to actually research what that was because that's his nickname. And his nickname was given to him by his trainer. But what is Huitlacoche? Huitlacoche is actually a fungus that grows on corn and this fungus is a, a dark blue almost purple color so uh as a this particular boxer's skin color was uh dark brown almost almost a, a hint of uh, blue and purple in his skin color so his coach named him uh or gave him that nickname huitlacoche now in mexico people eat huitlacoche it, it, they take the fungus off the corn and they make some delicious quesadillas with it. They make tacos with it. And I had the privilege of going to Mexico and actually trying it. I was a little hesitant because it's a fungus that grows on corn and it sounds disgusting. But let me tell you, it is delicious. If I could describe uh, what it tastes like, uh, I'm going to tell you that it tastes like portobello mushrooms. Um, that's the best uh, example of what I... I found it to taste like, and they'll you know they'll chop it up and they'll they'll put it they'll they'll, uh, they'll put it on a skillet and uh, throw it into your quesadilla with some cheese and it's like having a mushroom and cheese quesadilla. It is delicious. Uh, one thing that is that is amazing is that in other cultures, like for example in France, when they get that fungus on their corn, they just burn down their fields and start over because they feel that that fungus is, an, is a parasite, it's an, inv it's an invader. And in Mexico, being the experts that they are with corn and, and the history of corn, decide, somebody somewhere decided this is something we might want to try and eat. They, they were successful and because of it, there's a delicious food out there called Huitlacoche. That being said, Jose Huitlacoche Medel, was a boxer, uh, 1950s to the 1970s, uh, from Mexico City, from one of the toughest neighborhoods in Mexico. The neighborhood is Tepito. Now, this neighborhood is renowned for, for, for being uh, rough. It's renowned for being uh, tough. It's actually considered the neighborhood of the forgotten ones. And when you do a little research about Tepito, you realize that this is where all the people that, that didn't have a place to go, that were displaced during the conquests, during, during uh, uh, the invasion of the Spaniards into Mexico, uh, all these people kind of somehow ended up in this neighborhood. And the neighborhood is known as uh, a neighborhood of all the forgotten ones. Now, it is a very rough neighborhood. Um, it is a, 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 but that's kind of a bad rap. I had, the, I had the privilege and pleasure of actually going there and uh, enjoying some food and drink and so on and so forth. And it's a rough neighborhood. I would, I would equate it to maybe like the Bronx in New York, uh, maybe uh, the South Side in Chicago. Uh, it's, it's, it's rough. But one of the things that it's renowned for is it's hardworking people. Um, they have all kinds of swap meet, 
type uh, setups where they have booths and, and street vendors and, and anything that you want to buy. Um, they're very well known for uh, knockoff stuff. So you can get some knockoff Jordans. You can get some knockoff uh, bags. You can get it's, it's the capital of knockoff stuff in Mexico. But the reputation of its people being violent and rough is, is one, one aspect of it. But the other reputation is that uh, most of the vendors there, most of the people that live in that neighborhood are actually very hardworking people. And Jose with Tacoche Medel was not an exception. He, when he was a kid, he was a, a lemon or lime vendor. He was vending, uh, selling limes on the street. And when he started boxing, he started boxing at age 17. He becomes this phenomenal boxer. He's considered to have the best left hand in history. Uh, of boxing and the, these this is from scholars in, in the art of boxing that have that have said that he had the best left hand now you think this is a phenomenal boxer he starts boxing and he starts winning but actually in his very first professional fight he loses he doesn't give up he's a hard-working person from tepito he continues to work and uh continues to box continues to win continues to lose continues to win and eventually he gets to fight the number one prospect in Mexico, uh, who at that time went by the name Jose El Toluco Lopez. Now, Jose El Toluco Lopez was uh, also a very, uh, came from a very poor neighborhood. Uh, he actually worked as a bricklayer or a brick mason, uh, which in Mexico has the stigma of being the bottom of the barrel labor job you can get. Uh, being a bricklayer is it's got a bad stigma. It, it it makes people think that you're poor, that you're from a poor social class, that you that you that you're that you're just very, very poor. Uh, it's very hard, intensive labor to uh, be a brick mason. If you've ever had to put up a wall or set some bricks, you realize that uh, it's rough on your hands. Uh, the, the concrete, the cement mix, everything is rough on your hands. It's very acidic. Uh, and those guys are naturally strong from working masonry. Well, you have this brick mason, um, Jose Toluco Lopez, who is, who is the rising star in Mexican boxing. This guy is, is uh, everything anybody from a poor neighborhood wants to be. He's a guy that... Uh, has, has made some, some money boxing. He's out there having a good time with his money. He was known for surrounding himself with women. He was known for living it up, partying. He was also a very generous person. He, was, uh, he would often tip uh, not 20% or 30%. He'd tip double what uh, his uh, bill was a lot of the time. So if he had a $10 bill, a uh, uh, food bill or drink bill, he would tip $20. And, and that was something that, that uh, people really admired about him. So, so here you have two rising stars in the Mexican boxing world. Uh, and, and they're finally going to uh, see each other face to face. And they did. They ended up, they were uh, featherweight boxers, both of them. Uh, and they ended up fighting uh, August 1st, 1959. Now, uh, Jose... With La Coche against Jose Toluco. Uh, and, you, you know, just to keep it simple, I'm going to go by their nicknames. With La Coche versus Toluco. So what happened? Well, with La Coche goes into fight uh, Toluco. Toluco is the admired rising star of boxing. Uh, uh, with La Coche is the underdog. With La Coche ends up winning the fight by unanimous decision. Now, you would think that this would then shift everybody's focus towards Huitlacoche and everybody would celebrate him and everybody would be happy that they have a new champion. This guy is uh, a phenomenal guy, also poor, but it didn't turn out that way. It turned out that the Mexican public really didn't appreciate him beating Toluco Lopez. They thought that uh, he should have lost, that it was an unfair decision. Um, a lot of people would question him walking down the street. They would argue with him. They would say, what's the deal? What happened? Why, uh, why would you do that to us? So from the perspective of the poor communities, you could understand how the lifestyle that uh, Toluco Lupe, Lopez represented was something more appealing to them. With La Coche was a family man. He cared about his kids, cared about his wife. He cared about his family. He didn't party. He didn't drink. 
he just had a he he was just very serious about working and boxing because he was still working at the time. Uh, he he hadn't quite made the fortune that he needed to make to to stop working. So he still worked and trained and boxed. He beats Toluco and he is getting all of the public's outrage. He's walking down the street and he's being questioned by everyone. Anybody that sees him, they, they, they're upset at him and he can't understand this. His dreams are dashed. Because you have to understand that boxing in the 1950s, uh, it really mattered to get the public's support. Uh, not today so much. Today you'll see that a lot of uh, boxing is a business, uh, endorsements, so on and so forth. Whereas in the 1950s, it was getting that recognition. Well, he never got the recognition that he deserved. So what happened? They have a rematch. Yeah. So the rematch, the rematch happened. And you would think, okay, this is going to set the record straight. They ended up, they ended up fighting, uh, I believe it was November 19th, uh, 1960. What happened? Well, they were, they were both, uh, they both accepted a 12 round match and Huitlacoche knocks out Toluco Lopez in the sixth round. So he has a six, he, he defeats him in six, uh, I believe, no, it was the seventh round. He defeats him in the seventh round out of a 12 round fight. So now for sure, the Mexican public is on his side they have a new champion. They're happy. Uh, he proved himself right. Uh, wrong. Uh, their outrage and their disgust for him grew even more to the point to where he decides, I'm done with this. I'm going to go live in Japan. Why in Japan? I don't know. I tried to find articles about it. Uh, why, why, do, why decide to go to Japan in the 1950s, uh, 60s? I, I don't know uh, why that was appealing, but he decides to go to Japan and he decides to box in Japan professionally. You would think, well, poor guy. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a, a foreigner now fighting in another country, in another language. He's got to learn another language. Well, he ends up, he ends up fighting uh, the rising star in boxing at the time, the champion from Nippon, Japan. And uh, you're going to think, oh, no, well, uh, what happened? Well, he ended up defeating him. He ended up winning the fight against Masaiko Arada. That's Masaiko fighting Arada. Now, Masaiko fighting Arada was born April 5th, 1943. He was a boxing, uh, world boxing champion in the flyweight, bantamweight divisions. And uh, he was also challenged for the featherweight title twice. And he's currently the president of the Japanese Boxing Association. Yeah, he's still alive. So what happens? He defeats a Masaiko, um, and, and I hope I'm saying this right, Masaiko Arada. Uh, his nickname is Fighting Arada. So he defeats Masaiko Fighting Arada, and the Japanese public absolutely loses their mind, and they love this guy, and they adopt him as one of their own. Uh, he also had, like, very, uh, his facial features were very Asian-esque, <laughs> so... Uh, the Japanese public uh, uh, celebrated him. They, they respected his, his family values, his, his morality. They thought this is, this is an amazing champion. And he had, he's actually like considered one of the best fighters out of Japan in history. He's uh, on the wall in their, in their wall of fame and so on and so forth. And they celebrated him and they adopted him as one of their own. So it's interesting that uh, he's a foreigner in another country. He defeats their champion, their rising star in boxing, and, and instead of being rejected, gets accepted and ends up staying in Japan. He ends up staying in Japan for many years. Uh, he ended up fighting in different uh, uh, countries. He fought in the United States. He fought in Canada, fought in Brazil. He won some fights, lost some fights. He tried to go for a world championship and was defeated, so he didn't, he didn't become a world champion, but he was a Mexican national champion, and so he's still a champion nonetheless. And uh, time goes by, and uh, he decides that he's going to fight. He's going to return to Mexico uh, because he misses his home country, and he takes his winnings from boxing, and he's able to buy himself a home in Mexico and raise his family and, become, and devotes himself to training kids and prospects in boxing for the rest of his life. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away uh, the 1st of February 
2001 from a terminal cancer. That being said, it, it's amazing how uh, there is no profit in, in their hometown. It happens to me in stand-up. I don't perform a lot in my hometown. I used to do a lot of open mics. I used to do a lot of little bar shows. And in actuality, when I try and put on a show, I don't sell a lot of tickets. Uh, everybody's seen me. They're all my friends have seen me. Nobody really uh, supports you that way until you become really, really famous. But uh, I do have a lot of success in other countries, other cities. Uh, people actually come out and watch me. So I appreciate the support, guys. And, and you know, the lesson we can learn from this is that sometimes uh, we don't fit the ideology of our hometown. We don't, we don't fit the, 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 what, what they're expecting um, of us. And, and we get that rejection. Um, this is a great example of how someone uh, did what he had to do to, to keep going and actually found fame and success in another country and so with that uh i think this is a shit episode it's it's uh, it's amazing it, it's one of those things that uh, i didn't know and I, I was happy to be able to share with you guys so with that being said uh there's actually a gym in tepito uh there's a sports uh complex called the maracana sports complex and the gym's actually within that complex and it's the jose with la coche medel gym and it trains uh, uh, future champions. And with that, we wrap up this episode of the Shit Podcast. I want to thank you guys for joining me. Be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, hit the notifications bell. Leave your comments. Uh, thank you guys once again for, for uh, being with me. I apologize that the audio isn't the best. But with that, uh, thank you. I didn't want to not have an episode this week. So well, that wraps us up. That's it for this episode of the Shit Podcast. May you have... Uh, a good day.